Okay, we are interviewing Representative Frame, and she is running for election as state senator. Um, feel free to give us an introduction. You have two minutes. Great. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for having me here today. I feel like I'm at my family dinner table with people I've spent <laughs> a lot of time with over my last uh, 15 years living in the 36th district. Um, my name is Noelle Frame, and I have the great privilege of serving as your state representative and have had that honor uh, since January of 2016. Um, by way of background, as I just mentioned, I've lived in the district since 2005. I served as PCO off and on for um, 10 years. And then when I became a member of the legislature, I decided to share power and have other neighbors uh, serve in the PCO role. Uh, since serving in the legislature, I've served on a number of committees in my current, um, the current biennium, I am the chair of the House Finance Committee, leading on tax and fiscal policy. I also serve on the Appropriations Committee, which deals with spending, uh, and then also on the uh, uh, Community and Economic Development Committee, so money committees all day long for my three. Um, and of course, much of the work that I have done in my time in the legislature has been uh, partnering with marginalized communities um, to really address systemic change. I am myself a former foster parent, a role I served in in my um, early, sorry, I should say mid 20s and early 30s to kids in my own family. Uh, so, so, so much of my work has been focused there. Um, you know, when I think about why I want to continue serving the people of the 36th district, it's because at my absolute core, I believe that everybody deserves the chance to thrive. Um, but for too often of our neighbors, uh, barrier after barrier is put in front of them. And I have this distinct privilege of literally standing in the center of power uh, and to help our community members uh, break down those barriers to ensure they can thrive. So to that end, um, my three main focus areas uh, as I aspire to serve in the state Senate one, economic prosperity for all of us. It's becoming harder and harder to afford to live in our community. I don't want it just to be a playground for the rich. I want us to be able to afford to live here and thrive. Thank you. Um, working with our diverse communities to strengthen them, as I just mentioned, and of course, comprehensive progressive tax reform, which I'm happy to talk about more. Thanks for the opportunity to be here tonight. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we have uh, some prepared questions. Uh, and again, you have two minutes to answer each one of these. Um, Alice, how about number one? Sure. Uh, you're going to love this question. What tax reforms do you think are realistic in the next legislative session? And what would be your strategy for implementing them? What do you feel is the ideal tax structure for Washington state in the long term? Thank you so much for that question. I believe strongly that it is absolutely possible that we can pass the Washington state wealth tax, of which I'm the prime sponsor. That's House Bill 1406. I believe it is possible in our next session because we have momentum on our side. The people of Washington and frankly, the American public is strongly supportive of finally asking the wealthy to pay their fair share. When Elon Musk does things like buys Twitter for $44 billion when people are literally dying outside on the streets, um, it is getting to a fever pitch, the need for the wealthy to pay their fair share. We have momentum on our side. We passed the capital gains excise tax uh, in the 21 session as well as the working families tax credit. So at the same time we're asking the rich to pay their fair share, we're giving working Washingtonians a break. I could see us doing the wealth tax next session. I could see us expanding the working families tax credit. We are also looking at other uh, tax credits like a primary residence property tax tax exemption paired with a renter's credit so that you would get it no matter if you owned property or you were a renter. Um, and I am working very diligently right now on a replacement to the business and occupation tax, which is also regressive and deeply challenging for our small startup and low margin businesses, uh, working on in a bipartisan way on a modification uh, that we're working title is a margins tax It models something we've seen in other states, where all businesses would get to take one major deduction of their choosing rather than having 200 tax exemptions that have all been secured um, by those individual corporations and industries that can afford to hire lobbyists to come get them those tax breaks. I don't think that's right. I don't think it's fair. And I think we need a system that works for a broader set of our small business and low margin business community. Um, I still believe that income tax could be a great tool for us. Um, I do not want us to piggyback onto the federal tax code. The more I learn about it, the federal tax code is broken. It has been important. Uh, very hard by corporations who barely pay anything in federal taxes anymore. So if we were to do that, I'd want us to have our own state system and happy to talk more about it as always. Thank you for the question. Perfect. Thank you. Um, question number two, Sarah, do you want to take that one? Certainly. Giving a 
falling enrollment over the past two years, our school districts are facing a new funding crisis on top of the bare minimum funding levels in place before the pandemic. What will you do to ensure that our schools are fully funded? Thanks for that uh, question. So I will say one of the things, um, this of course, a lot of this comes back to the tax structure itself and that we have a tax structure um, that has, um, it's had increasing revenue in the last couple of years. And I just wanna be clear for folks that are not really you know, following that closely. We have some weird economic distortions as a consequence of the pandemic. Um, and we've had a lot of federal money coming down. So while our budgets have looked larger in recent years, um, I actually really don't expect that to continue. And when we get back to a little bit more of a sense of a norm, we're gonna have the same problems with our underlying tax structure that we've had for decades. So first and foremost, uh, fix our upside down and regressive tax code. Uh, in particular, we are looking at, as it relates to school financing, um, whether or not we should uh, undo finally Tim Iman's 1% cap on property tax growth limits that does not reflect inflation, does not reflect changes in population, and instead move to um, a, a more reasonable property tax limit growth factor that will help us um, as we take on these challenges. I think in the meantime, uh, we have to do what we have done these last two sessions, which is um, you know, basically stop gaps to help acknowledge that we are in a really weird time. We've had a lot of families fall out of the public school system. I expect them to come back, but they will come back when they can reliably count on schools and daycares to stay open so they can go to work. As the mom of a 21 month old that has had like very luckily has a partner who has flexibility, um, not being able to rely on our school to be open consistently um, if I didn't have a partner that was able to help me, I couldn't have gone back to work uh, full-time in the legislature and in my other job. Um, so I think we just need to continue to monitor it. Um, I will just say, lastly, there's two different things, big problems I see looming. We continue to underfund special education, which I'm not even I'm sure serious. how we're not violating the federal constitution and the American with Disabilities Act. That needs to change. We also have McCleary 2.0 coming at us uh, with the lawsuit filed against us on school construction, and we're going to need to take care of that too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question number three, Pat, do you want to take that one? Uh, sure, sorry, I'll meet myself there. How have you worked to reduce climate change and specifically how will you take ambitious steps to address the largest drivers of climate change and greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, can I throw in, uh, uh, what, do you, what do you see? I work in the nuclear industry, so of course I gotta say, what, how do you see nuclear fits into this? Uh, great, thank you so much, Pat, for that. Um, so. At a high level, I'll just say we've taken gigantic steps forward over the last couple of sessions. So if the answer is like, how are we gonna combat climate change? It is really monitoring implementation of some of the really good legislation that we have passed. Um, the Climate Commitment Act, the Clean Fuel Standards, we passed um, bills around uh, building emissions. Uh, we're building out a whole clean, you know, clean energy uh, economy. Like we have to monitor this stuff really closely. And I will just tell you, like one of the bills I had to deal with in finance this year was around clean energy projects because it, we passed the bill, but the implementation and actually the siting of the clean energy projects wasn't happening fast enough. And so really paying attention to implementation is going to be key. Um, one of, I think the big missed opportunities this session uh, was Representative Davina Dorr's bill around comprehensive planning uh, and infusing climate change into comprehensive planning. It's really nerdy, but this is how we do our work in Washington State. Our Growth Management Act and our cycle of comprehensive planning is how we all collectively as uh, the state governments, but most importantly, are the subdivisions of the state government, the cities and the counties, do their planning and having climate change as a lens through which they do that work is critical. That bill died in the final literally minutes of the session um, and was pretty heartbreaking. And frankly, we've missed a big opportunity with some of the biggest cities in their planning cycle this year. Um, so we need to keep pushing on that. Um, Pat, as it relates to nuclear, I gotta be honest, it just hasn't really been a big part of the conversation in recent years. Um, you know, We often talk a lot about the Hanford nuclear site and all of the fallout, fallout, haha, pun intended, um, over years of um, not properly sequestering nuclear waste from that site and that it's a super fund and that we have cleanup that we continue to do and the impacts uh, to the people there. Um, so I always kind of am, am quite cautious about nuclear, but it really has not been much of a conversation for us lately in the ledge. Thank you. Great, thank you. Sherry, do you wanna take the fourth question? Sure. Um, 
In addition to uh, in addition to the climate crisis, King County has been in a homelessness state of emergency since 2015, and our entire state is facing a housing crisis. Do you agree that we need to add additional housing, and what will you do to ensure that all cities in our region are building the housing we need? Uh, Lord, yes, I agree that this is a massive crisis. Um, the crisis of homelessness is it's a humanitarian crisis. I, I think like many of you, um, I have neighbors who are living unhoused in tents, a half a block to a block from my front door. I see it every single day like everybody else does and it's unacceptable. Um, so many people are living with co-occurring disorders, behavioral health, medical issues. So I will just say first and foremost, yes, we need more housing. I think the investments we made as a legislature last year and this year in the biennial and supplemental budget are historic level investments in permanent supportive housing, which is that combined housing and services that helps folks that have those co-occurring disorders. But we can't stop there. We have really a two-part problem. One, we have a massive supply issue. It's been building over the course of 10 years. I don't know if folks have seen the Lieutenant Governor's report, but we have now the lowest number of housing units per household of any state in the country. It's a problem that's built over 10 years. It is a massive economic vulnerability for us, for our economy. So we need to deal with the supply, which means we need, need to deal with zoning. And if the cities, if we can't mandate them to do it, which so far we've not been successful, we need to do incentives similar to how we did with House Bill 1923, where we gave them a menu of options that said, if you do these things, you get these benefits, you get planning grants, et cetera. We need to do that, but of course, if it's not affordable, it doesn't matter. I'm really excited about recommendations coming out of the Racial Disparities in Home Ownership Work Group, which I also have the privilege of working on as a, a consultant, in addition to being a legislator. Um, and I'm happy about steps we took this year. We passed an exemption so that any affordable housing developer, nonprofit or government that is acquiring land for the purpose of housing doesn't have to pay the real estate excise tax. In seconds. We need to be really thoughtful and tactical about what else we can do to reduce the cost of housing so we can build more housing, whether it's Habitat for Humanity, Land Trust, co Limited Equity Cooperatives, or Rental Housing. Great, thank you. Um, so we're going to move to questions from the e-board. And again, you've got a, min a minute to uh, answer each one of these. Um, uh, Barbara has her hand up. Hi, Noel. So I have a question, a follow-on question for you about the B&O tax. Mm -hmm. And I was a small um, uh, professional consultant for 40 years in Seattle. And the B&O tax drove me insane because um, I was small and it was, you know, it was a burden. So I wanted to ask you uh, if you would uh, add to what are, what are the sort of the nuts and bolts of what you're trying to do to fix it. And then I wanted to ask you uh, a corollary to that. Um, this is, I think, in doorbelling or campaigning, um, business people are afraid of the change in the, so how would you recommend that we campaign on that issue in your favor, if we were to campaign in your favor? Thank you. Um, I think in terms of my, I'll start with that first question first, because it is, it's so technical, Barbara, I think people just hearing that a Democrat is thinking about taxation as it relates to small business and having a system that's more fair for small business is like on a campaign message. That's, that's what people, you need. That's what, that's all they need right now. The, the level of technical detail that we are engaged in right now is fierce. I am having a bunch of meetings leading up to this meeting on May 25th. And it's detailed that even some of the lobbyists that have worked on tax policy for years are struggling with. It's economic nexus, it's apportionment, it's you know how you know entity level filing or conglomerate level filing. Nobody cares about this stuff except the people that have to do it. Um, or have so, to file, you file it. Exactly. Excuse so, me for interrupting. So it's okay. So I mean, basically, the, the bottom line, Barbara, is we have gross receipts where you are paying on every dollar coming seconds. through the door. I gave businesses through over a year of public engagement options. They could have gone a value added tax. They could have gone all the way to net receipts to corporate income tax. And then we had this thing that was sort of in the middle, which was margins, which is modified gross receipts where they get to take one major deduction, cost of goods sold, cost of labor, a flat deduction of like 30% or a flat amount, like a million dollars before their tax is calculated. That's the direction we're going. That's what was advanced through the process by a bipartisan group. And now we're working through the technical details so that again, 
The only people who get relief from the B&O tax, the inherent unfair structure, are those that can afford a lobbyist to come down and ask for a tax break. And they've been very successful because their arguments are rational because the underlying tax is irrational. Um, now I'm trying to fix it for everybody. So thanks for the question. I appreciate Great question. It. Great answer. Thank you. Uh, Sarah. So as you know, Washington has chronically underfunded mental health and we're making some progress in recent years. So I just wanted to get your ideas on addressing our mental health funding crisis and expanding access, particularly to behavioral and mental health for our marginalized communities in Seattle and particularly the 36th district. Yeah, it's a really great question, Sarah, and you're right. And I, I will just say there's so many directions I could go with this, but what I will boil it down to is workforce shortages. The lack of workforce for behavioral health is a huge problem. And it was a huge problem before we made the very good move towards telehealth. We've been asking for telehealth for years. The pandemic blew the lid off that. Now we can do telehealth, but we haven't caught up on the providers. So the decisions that we made this year, those rate increases that we did with all this federal money coming through and the, the revenue that was not expected because of all these economic distortions, that will go a long way. You know, creating um, pathways through our higher education institution to get more people into the field, the teaching hospital at UW that we created a couple of years ago on behavioral health. Seconds. These are all things that if we can, if we could tackle the workforce issue, it would go a long way to solving the rest of the issues in behavioral health. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we got time for maybe maybe two more. Stephanie. I'll answer shorter. Yeah, OK. Um, thank you. Um, I've got a, another um, kind of a follow on to the climate question. Uh, I know you mentioned um, the the bills that we have passed, including the most recent one around siting and trying to get more clean energy projects developed. A lot of those um, for a variety of mostly good reasons end up in Eastern Washington, but I know that is both controversial and also not the only place that we can advance a clean energy economy. And I'm wondering what kinds of opportunities you see here in the 36th or closer to our district where we might be able to contribute. Great question. I mean, Stephanie, I will say that within a tight urban area, you're right. Some of the opportunities are limited. Those clean energy projects often need to be um, with big sun exposure for wind, near water, for other things. So I mean, I see opportunities for expansion of light duty manufacturing in the 36th district. I think we still do have space for that. How that intersects with the clean energy economy, I'm not 100% sure, but still thinking about, you know, we want to grow the manufacturing sector. That's an opportunity for growth in jobs, middle wage jobs, family wage jobs um, that are part of that sort of economic prosperity for all of us. But the intersection with clean energy is tough because I think you're, you're naming it that it often intersects with sort of the features of Eastern Washington. That said, these, legis these pieces of legislation are not geographically limited. They're, not, they're geographically neutral. So if there was an opportunity in our neck of the woods, it's totally a possibility. Um, Clayton, I'm sorry. I think we're, we're just to stick to our rules. I think we got we to um, move to uh, Representative Frame's uh, closing, closing statement. Clayton, I'll get you on the first question next, next go around. But um, yeah, Representative Frame, if you have a, a last, like a one minute closing, we'd love to hear that. Thanks. And Clayton, you can always call me. We can talk. Um, <laughs> thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Um, obviously, I, at this point, I am still unopposed in this race. And even if that changes uh, or doesn't change, I would still love to have the endorsement of the 36. It matters to me that we knock on doors, we talk to our residents, we carry our lit. I would love to have my endorsement in there so people know that I have been working for them and representing them for, by the end of this year, seven years. And I would love the opportunity to do it for four more. This is my political family. I love that we organize together and I hope I'll get to be part of that endorsed team again this year. So thank you for taking your time this evening to talk with me. Thank you. Well, we very much appreciate it. Thank you. Come, thank you for coming. I was going to, I keep saying thank you for coming down, but thank you for coming to this virtual space on a wonderful Monday night and uh, best of luck. Thank you so much.